continue. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our 2020-21 National Field Hockey Rules Briefing. Tonight, uh, it's great to have you with us. Um, we have some help in the background tonight with uh, Casey Meader and Liz Chu, uh, who are going to help us. They're the producers of the program, so they're going to help us through some things. So I'm going to turn it over to Casey real quick for some instructions, and then we'll come back uh, and get started. So Casey, over to you. Awesome. Hi, guys. My name is Casey Nieder. I am the Futures Coordinator for USA Field Hockey. I've been with this organization for about almost two years, and I don't get to work with Steve that much. So when I do, it's a lot of fun. So I'm happy to be here tonight to help him out and be on the background with Liz. Uh, so just some few housekeeping things. In the right corner of your app, you should see a little box with a question mark. That is where you want to go to put any questions you have throughout this whole presentation. Um, so just go put them in there a while. Um, if you have any throughout, whatever slide Steve is on, put them in there. Um, and any question that we don't get to, we will save and we'll make sure that we get that out to you guys. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, I'm going to send it back to Steve. Thanks, Casey. Greatly appreciate it. So yeah, um, my name is Steve Horgan. I'm the director of umpiring for USA Field Hockey. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to represent USA Field Hockey and the Pan Am Hockey Federation on the uh, International Rules Committee as well. That gives us a chance in the USA to have a big input into how the rules are developed and different things that are going on. Uh, we also work with the NCAA and the NFHS uh, and the rules and everything we go through tonight will be uh, associated with all three. Uh, the biggest reason we've done this, and we've had this briefing just about every year for the last, geez, 10 years probably, um, and we want to try to get a consistent message out. Uh, the actual playing rules, whether it's NCAA, USA Field Hockey, or the uh, NFHS, uh, the, the actual playing rules are the same, and we want to make sure that we can get a consistency uh, across the board. So again, it's great having you with us. Um, again, feel free to ask your questions. Uh, we expect to have this presentation for about an hour, and then we'll have some time for questions to be answered live. And again, as Casey said, any questions that we don't get to, we will compile, and we will also put those on the USA website, and I'll explain some of that to you uh, as we uh, get down to the bottom of the presentation. Okay, Casey, would you kindly show my screen to our participants? She'll be there for you, Steve. Okay, all right, very good. Thank you so much. Okay, let's talk about real quick, everybody's favorite topic right now, which is unfortunately the pandemic that we're going through. Um, Umpires, coaches, teams, everybody needs to know their local local and state guidelines. Um, please follow them. Uh, they will change. Uh, be aware of crossing state lines. Between Delaware and Pennsylvania, I can at least say I do know for a fact there's a lot of changes uh, or a lot of differences in what's being asked. So please be aware of all of your guidelines, uh, especially the college umpires. Uh, as of right now, we do have one college conference that's getting ready to start at the end of the week, and you could be in three or four different states in a very short period of time. So please make sure you know those. Uh, always carry a mask with you. Wear it as much as possible. That's CDC guidelines. So do the best you can. All right. And protect yourself and others. That's of the utmost important, important yeah, importance. We want everybody around for a long period of time. Okay. All right. Uh, playing rules changes uh, for USA field hockey and the NCA. There are really no uh, significant changes for 2020 and there will not be any for 2021. The reason for that is the Olympics was pushed back. So in turn, uh, the FIH and us at USA field hockey uh, typically do not make any major changes within a year of the Olympics. So now that they're through to 2021 August, that would mean this season, the spring season for those that will play in the spring, and then into the fall of next year, we'll hold the same rules 
uh, throughout. The next rule book is expected to come out in 2022. Uh, from the high school level, uh, the NFHS, there are some significant changes. Uh, just real quick, the mouth guards are allowed to have them cover their lips now, which wasn't in the past. They did clarify the wording. Now it's in line with USA Field Hockey and the NCAA of the free hit inside the 25-yard line where the ball uh, needs to move five yards unless it's touched by a player of the defending team. Uh, that wasn't in the rule before. Another significant rule change for the uh, NFHS is they will be playing four quarters. Similar, well, exactly the way the uh, uh, NCAA does, okay? Uh, the the only difference with this is there are now four times instead of two that there's the possibility of an extended corner. After every quarter, if a penalty corner is still going, it must be completed before that quarter ends. Okay, so be four times instead of two. The time is not stopped on a penalty corner. So the penalty corners that you have administered up to this point is the same process you will have now the same process as the previous rule. So nothing changes there. So it's just very simple. You're going to four 15 minute quarters and they have removed the timeouts. So that'll help. There's actually built in timeouts with a two minute break between the first and second quarter and between the third and fourth quarter. The other pool rules playing changes at the NFHS is goggles are not required anymore. But even though that has changed, Goggles may be worn. They're allowed to be worn. Uh, st some state associations are still mandating it, and that's okay. Uh, parents and their, their students and schools can elect to wear them or not, okay? But they are not mandatory anymore. But please be aware of your state association rules because each state may look at this a little bit differently. Also, the use of face masks for, for defending penalty corners uh, is no longer prohibited. So they are allowed. But each state is looking at those a little different. Um, so be sure to uh, check with your state association for the uh, applications of that change as well. OK, so uh, with the NFHS rules, just be in touch with your national association. OK, let's get into the meat of everything. Um, just so you know, I did a little bit of a survey with um, some coaches, some umpires, and some assigners to try to put together the topics that were most important for this briefing. This briefing is not going to be all encompassing of the rules. It's not going to uh, give us, you know, we're not going through every rule, but we're going to go through a lot of the highlights and the, the major points that seem to be, I'll use the word bone of contention for uh, uh, many of our folks. And the whole idea is to reach a consistency uh, at every level. So for the free hits, um, all free hits and self-start rules will be applied the same across the field. There is really no difference if it's within five yards of the circle or not, okay? Um, I'm gonna skip just to the bottom paragraph. The only restriction of the, of the free hit inside the 23 or 20, 23 meter area, 25 yard area, is that the attack team cannot play the ball into the circle until it's moved at least five meters yards or touched by a defender. That's the only restriction. Everything else is exactly the same. The thing that folks forget about and things that uh, are difficult to understand is players can move now in any direction to get the five yards away from the free hit. They do not have to back straight up, but in their process of backing up, if the free hit is taken to the right or to the left, they can now move to the right or to the left to meet the person at the five yards, provided they're not influencing the play in that process. One of the problems that we have is umpires are overreactive, especially inside the 23 meter area or 25 yard area. They tend to be more strict and look for things that may or may not be there. So we want umpires to get reach a consistency across the field, over the entire field. So keep in mind that anything allowed in the midfield must be allowed within the 23 meter or the 25 yard area, okay? That is just the requirements. Um, and that's a consistency thing as well uh, for not only the fans, but for the coaches, the players, video that's out there. It's quite simple to, uh, 
uh, to see and be consistent with as long as we're consistent across the whole field. Okay, I'm going to run a couple videos here. I want to run this through, and what you're going to see in this one is the free hit's going to be taken, and the player in purple is just going to run by the side until the player hits it in. She's not influencing the play. She's well away from the play. Oops, sorry. Once the free hit is allowed, luckily she doesn't hit the ball away. But right here when the free hit is taken, she turns and just runs with the player. This is the, the epitome of shadowing, perfectly legal. She is not influencing the play. And this player, right, oh, this player right here is five meters away. So the girl moves at five yards, hits it in. And as it turns out, it does become a goal. In our next one, uh, these are the ones that people get very uh, uh, critical with. But I want from this angle, you're going to see how the defender actually stays along the circle line and does nothing. I'm going to run it through first. And you're going to see when the free hit's taken, number 15 or I'm sorry, number five, goes right along the circle line and does absolutely nothing to influence the play. So when the free hit is taken right there, number five backs up and shadows, keeping in mind that the player to the left standing on the circle line is absolutely five meters, five yards away. So as the player goes along the circle line, she's not doing anything to channel. She's not pressing forward. She doesn't really have to back up because she's trying to get to the five meters. And of course, unfortunately, when the tackle happens, the umpire actually awards a penalty corner on this. And by the video, it's pretty much unjustified because the defense did nothing wrong. They shadowed properly and the person doing the tackling was five meters away when the free hit started. So this should have really just played on uh, uh, without the penalty corner. Another one, and this one's a little bit questionable, and this is unfortunately what umpires see. And I wanna make sure that you can see this. It's a little choppy, but number seven actually takes a little bit of a step in and the umpire awards the penalty corner and points to number seven. What you may or may not see is that when the free hit is taken right here, number seven actually steps in a little bit. She actually right about there steps in and then backs her way out. And that's pretty much what the umpire saw. So the suggestion would be from a defensive standpoint, and I am not a coach and I don't intend to be, but from an umpire standpoint, if you try to close that gap up as the player's moving, trying to move the ball to five meters, the greater chance there is of the umpire making a judgment that that is influencing the play. So be very careful about that as you are shadowing. The closer you try to get, the more chance there is of an umpire uh, deeming that as uh, uh, influencing the play. And here's one that I'm going to run it a couple times. The player takes the free hit right there with three blue players around her. And the umpire just resets the foul. And the foul's in the exact same spot where the umpire blew the whistle. This should have been a penalty corner against the blue team. The player took the self-start legally. She went to move and was stopped immediately by the team in blue. These are not resets. Those actions of influencing the play in this type of situation are not done by accident. They've put their stick down. They tried to block tackle. So they're influencing the play. So situations like this should absolutely be a penalty corner. 
And depending on the context of the game, of the game a card could be added to it. Here's one that's a little bit unfortunate, but I, this is why we talk about all over the field, okay, that we cannot uh, wrongfully penalize folks. And you're going to see, luckily, to, to try to make the point, we actually have football field lines here, so you're going to see some of the distances. But the player takes the free hit there on the sideline, and when she does, the player was only about three meters away, but then she continued to back up to the five and then engage the player at about six yards away. All perfectly legal. But unfortunately, in this situation, she sent off with a card, and it looks like a five-minute yellow card because of the context of the game. So right here, the player's taking the free hit, and you can see there's actually about three, three meters, maybe four meters when she starts, okay, uh, distance apart. And then, of course, she continues to back up, and she doesn't engage the player until after the five yards. So this should not have been uh, given as a, as a foul or a card. Now, so umpires need to be aware of that. And you also have to put yourself in a position to be able to see the depth perception in this. The umpire is right in line with this play. So I'm sure that was very difficult for them to see. But step out of the field or into the field to be able to see that depth perception to do the best you can to get the decision correct. Okay, this one's a little bit different and is influencing the play. <clears throat> the free hits awarded, they bring it in, they stop it, and the player from behind is actually the one that gets involved in the play. And that's where the problem begins or the problem is. The player stops the ball right here, and then she takes the free hit there, and the player right by the 25-yard line is not five meters away, and then eventually comes in from behind, affecting the play, not allowing the team in, in the dark team to go at least five meters before being interfered with by someone who was within five meters of the start. That sounds like a lot of wording, but it's quite simple. If they're not five meters away, five yards away, they cannot influence the play until the player has taken it at least five yards. <clears throat> Here's one that is, is uh, always questionable, but what you're going to see, and the, the main part of the play is going to be on the right-hand side of the screen, <clears throat> right over in this area, where the player takes the free hit, and then passes it into the circle. The question on this one was, should it not have been a free hit out because she passed it into the circle? But what you're going to see, and that's the question that is happening right here with the, with the team, what you're going to see is right here when the free hit is taken, the player right in front of the umpire is not five yards away, but she's right on the circle line. So she is fine there when the free hit starts. And then as the free hit continues, she slides to the left, which she's perfectly capable of doing because the player can't bring the ball into the circle. But what she does is she actually steps out there and influences the play before the ball goes into the circle. So it's the first foul of the influencing the play that led to the penalty corner. With just a little bit of patience, this one could have, would have gone the other direction because the player did not move the ball the five meters before going into the circle. But it takes a little bit of patience, especially along the circle's edge. Hey, Steve, real quick, can you hear me? Yes. Is there any way with the videos you can make it a full slideshow? We have some people saying that they can't see it too well. Okay. Yes. I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. Do the best okay. I can. Okay, we'll go that way. Is that better, Case? Yep, much better. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, uh, I know this is very fast-paced, but we only have about an hour, so I want to make sure we get through all the material, and you will be able to look at this again uh, later on. So uh, uh, you'll be able to watch it in your time and uh, ask questions accordingly, okay? One of the other things that, that uh, came to light 
was uh, intentional fouls inside the 23 meter line or the 25 yard area. Hockey went through a little bit of a process of some of these intentional fouls. Uh, umpires were just giving cards because of the minimal impact on the play, or it was so far away from the circle that they might not get into the circle. That is now gone. Both the FIH NCAA rule, which is 12.3, and the NFHS rule 10.1.1b, both say pretty much the same thing, that a penalty corner is awarded for an intentional offense by a defender outside the circle, but within the 23 meter area, and a penalty corner shall be awarded when the defense commits a deliberate foul inside the 25 yard line, but outside the circle, okay? There is no gray area on this. If it's an intentional foul, the, the penalty is a penalty corner. Whether you're, you know, a player is hitting the ball away, um, delaying the free hit, standing over it, trying to influence the free hit like we just showed in some of the previous uh, uh, videos, all of those are penalty corners. It is not reset, verbal warning. That is not what the rules want. And this will allow for a consistency of understanding on the player's part, the coach's part, the fan's part, uh, and the umpire's, so that it's totally understood um, what will happen when some of these uh, intentional fouls go on, all right? There are no personal interpretations, all right? An intentional foul is a penalty corner. The impact of play or the location within the 23 meter area or 25 yard area is not relevant to the decision. The foul is the foul, the penalty is the penalty. And we need to make sure that um, it's administered properly. Okay, here's just a quick example. Um, you're gonna see up here in this area, right here, this white player literally pulls the ball with the back of the stick. Okay, the umpire gives a free hit and then gives the card for the back of the stick. Okay, but does not award the penalty corner. So they're restarting with a free hit. If it's again, these are the kind of things that in the past umpires might look at or people might look at and go, well, she wasn't going to get into the circle anyway. That doesn't matter. It's an intentional foul, should have been a penalty corner. Here's another one that's relatively subtle, but this is a simple intentional obstruction. The player gets turned around. She has no intention of playing the ball and just literally turns in front of the player and you can see she backs up. She knows exactly what she did, okay? And in this case, as you can see, the umpire does pick up on it and does call this a penalty corner, okay? These are a couple of the subtle ones, all right? The obvious ones are easy, the hard back tackles, the hitting the ball away, things of that nature. Those are the easier ones for umpires to pick up, but I wanted to show that some of these simple ones that might not seem to have a big effect on the game are still and should be penalty corners. Okay. Here's another one. We're going to talk about physicality, but inside the 23 meter line, which we're in now inside the 25 yard line, those little pushes like that where the player gets thrown off of their pace. Those are physical challenges that need to be addressed. And unfortunately in this one, you're gonna see she gets off her pace and she eventually loses the ball, okay? She could have just as easily gone down to the ground, gotten hurt. She was actually disadvantaged by, by the arm on the back. And in turn, this needs to be addressed. Um, with a penalty corner, and in this case, possibly a card. Okay. All right. Now on to another favorite subject of quite a number of people uh, is aerial balls. And I've highlighted a few things here. Um, we know that this can be perceived as one of the most inconsistent decisions that umpires make, but we're going to do the best we can to try to close that down. I'm gonna start with the rules themselves. And at the at, uh, the NCAA and FIH rule basically talks about approaching within five meters 
of an opponent receiving a falling raised ball. And falling is boded for a reason. And even with the NFHS, it's approaching within five yards of an opponent receiving a falling raised ball. The issue here has always been, when does the player have to be five meters clear for it to be able to be played on? That finally is getting addressed or was addressed late last year. Actually, it was in September, but really didn't make it into the changes because uh, we were in the middle of the season. All right. It's a falling aerial ball, not a uh, so the player must be clear when the ball is falling, not as it goes up. So the initial receiver has the right to the ball. And if it's not clear which player is the initial receiver, the player of the team which raised the ball must allow the opponent to receive it. That's part of the rule that many people forget about. If it is not clear, and we're talking about five meters clear, five yards clear, then the team who raised it must allow the opponent to receive it. And the FIH Rules Committee got into this because there was so much confusion. But the whole idea is to ensure the player safety, safety so that there's an elimination of a contest for two people trying to get a falling ball, meaning sticks up in the air, bodies coming into each other in a 50-50 mode. Okay, And it ensures an unfair, that an unfair advantage isn't, isn't gained uh, by the side who throws it. The idea of just throwing aerial balls now to throw them is almost going to be non-existent because if you do that, the chances of where the ball is falling, it will not be clear who it's coming down to. The ball should really be thrown with an intent. I'm going to show you some videos here in a few minutes or in a couple minutes um, so that the player you're throwing it to is clear. Um, that's going to make it so much easier. If you're just going to throw it to throw it, you're almost giving it up. And if that's the choice of the team to throw it, and I'm going to use the, a football analogy, if you're throwing it to like punt a football to gain the yardage, then so be it. But you can pretty much be assured you're going to give up possession at that other end because nobody's going to know who it's going to. It's just being thrown to be thrown, so it's going to be unclear, and then it'll go against the team that put it up. And now you can see with the NFHS rule, even though there's a little bit more wording here, the intent and the application of this rule is exactly the same. So whether you're doing high school hockey, USA field hockey, NCAA hockey, international hockey, they are all the same. And that's where we want to get with the consistency. <clears throat> we want, uh, from the umpire standpoint, we want early recognition, okay? That helps prevent the danger uh, or any type of advantage gained. And this, I've underlined this statement because this is one of the most important statements in the rule and the application of it. Usually it's an attempt from an attacker to an attacker to throw the ball. So an attacker receiving a falling aerial ball must be in clear five meter, five yard space when the ball, excuse me, when the ball is falling or about 20 meters, 25 yards from where the ball will be received. So when the ball is falling, if that player on the attacking team is not clear, then it needs to be blown against the team to put it up. And the team, the other team gets the ball where the ball was falling, not where the ball was thrown up. It's where the ball is coming down. All right. <clears throat> there is the possibility of legitimate uh, interceptions from outside the five meter area that they're uncontested. These will be ones that would come across at the at about the five meters where they collect the ball in the air. We are not talking about going right in front of someone. There has to be playing space, not within playing distance of each other, well in front of them. Now that we can play the ball over the head, this is likely to happen more often, but you definitely have to have that uh, space outside the five meters and outside of the playing distance so that it can be done safely. Again, Early judgment over the last 25 yards, 20 meters, okay? Uh, is there a contest? If there's a contest for the thing, it is not clear. The idea of players just stepping in front of somebody at the last minute thinking they're going to be the clear receiver is now gone. The judgment is going to be made much earlier than that. You'll see that in a video, in a couple videos, okay? It has to be who will clearly 
get to the ball first. And defined by the previous slide, five meters of space. So we need to make sure that it's wide open when that ball is falling. There's a difference between a ball landing amongst players and a ball possibly being intercepted in the air. If it's coming down in between players, just like everywhere else on the field, a ball pops up in between two players, there's a deflection between two players, it's called for danger almost immediately. That has to be the same process here. Okay, when two players are close to each other, it must be called. When the ball is landing, the umpire must decide who clearly has the five meter or five yard space. If it's not there, it must be blown. If the space is there and someone has the chance to intercept it outside of that space and well outside of playing distance, you can play on. All right. But I think those are going to be kind of minimal. But this is all part of the process. OK. The biggest key here is early recognition. And what you're going to see, and I'm going to run this a couple times, is the ball comes off of the sideline by the white team right down the sideline, and you're going to see three players right there all close to each other. And what I would like to show you here is if you watch the umpire, the ball actually goes up. Get to it. And just as the ball is starting to fall, you see him put his whistle to his mouth, blows the whistle, and points in the direction. This is the early recognition necessary to keep things safe. We cannot wait anymore until the ball comes down any further to decide what the, or to indicate what the decision is going to be. This, if he doesn't blow his whistle, there's the possibility of. Oops, let me get to it again. Sorry. There's the possibility of a deflection into two players. You got a player in the red on the back of a player in white, and it's just a, a recipe for disaster. That is why when the ball is falling, and you can see here over the last 20 meters or so, uh, 25 yards, this is less than 25 yards as it's falling, but that's the decision that has to be made. I know we're going to get the question on what happens if it doesn't go the 25 meters or doesn't go the 25 yards. All that means is the umpires are going to have to make a decision that much sooner. You're going to have to recognize the arc of the ball and you're going to have to make a decision. And Steve, real quick, before you go to this video, we do have a question and it may or may not have been answered already, but uh, someone asked, what if it is thrown into open space? We're going to get to open space in just a minute. Well, I actually have a couple videos on that. The bottom awesome. line is, even though it's flown in, thrown into open space, just because it hits the ground does not negate the rule of the five meters. Uh, it can bounce into two players on a 50-50 ball, and that still also needs to be blown because the receiver is not clear. There is nothing in the rules that allows for it to negate just because it hits the ground. The team putting up is still responsible for it by putting it into space. Okay, here's one that's going to go up and is called way too late. This is what we want to try to avoid. Two players putting their sticks up in the air and uh, playing the ball. And, you know, again, early recognition and what you're going to find, especially in this type of situation, is after you have two players right there, obviously not five yards away from each other, and both of them start to put their sticks up in the air. So right about here, is where the ball needs to be blown as just as just as it just comes into the camera. By doing that, this player doesn't play the ball or it stops here, okay? And then now when the umpire blows the whistle, the free hit is actually taken almost five yards up further from where the foul occurred. So early recognition will also help you with the foul placement. Uh, and many of these, now they don't reset this one, but some of these do end up getting reset and you waste some time doing that. The early recognition will help you with that decision. Here's the one after the bounce that uh, the question was just on, and that's fair enough. Um, you're gonna see two players go with this ball. The ball bounces, and you basically have two players going 50-50, and the umpire just let it go, all right? This is no different than the ball falling 
right at these two players. When this ball bounces into the open space, you see two players running 50-50. It is not clear who's going to get this ball. At this point, you cannot wait until two players try to play it and the ball pops up and hits somebody in the face or you have a trip because the ball starts to come down or whatever the case may be. This is about safety and consistency. This is not clear. The white team is the team, that the team in white is the one that put it up. They are responsible. And at this point, right here, actually should happen before that, that the, the, um, the ball should be blown and a free hit right there at midfield should be given to the dark team and play would go in the other direction. Here's one where the defender, the white team is putting the ball up and the defender is five meters clear. This is what you're looking for to allow for the ball to play on, the game to play on. You'll see the player missed it. Oh, I'm sorry. This is white to white. This is the attacker. I'm sorry, not the defender. Uh, my mistake. I got ahead of myself. You're going to see that the player is, the ball is thrown quite legally. My apologies. And as the ball is falling, right here, the last player in the picture continues to run. But the ball bounces, okay? And it's quite obvious by the bounce that the player in white is the intended, not the intended, the initial receiver. And the player in blue comes within the five yards to play it and in turn creates the foul. This should have been a free hit outside the circle to the team in white because the blue player came into the five meter area as the ball was being received and there was no opportunity to control it and get it on the ground. Here's one with the defender. Try to make this clear as well. The ball goes up quite easily and then the defender is in five meter space. Unfortunately, she misses it, but that's not the point of the video. The point of the video is that the ball goes up. This player is five meters clear. <clears throat> the player in red is five meters away. She has every opportunity to play it. In this situation, unfortunately, she misses it. And then everything beyond that is has to deal with danger. This was not a ball thrown into open space. Everything beyond that has to do with danger. But this is your typical situation of play on because the defender is five meters clear. And in here, here's a nice aerial throw that the umpire is so late making the decision that the ball actually moves up a good eight to 10 yards and then is taken on the other side of the 50 yard line. This is what I was talking about a little bit earlier, how the early recognition will help with the ball placement. Look at the time that is lost here by the ball having to come all the way back to where the umpire wanted it. And this is due to the late whistle. So. Early recognition right back to the very first statement we made on aerial balls will help with that process as well. And here's one that is actually thrown into the circle uh, from outside the 25 yard line, okay? And in all fairness for this one, when this one actually happened last year during the season, uh, this would have been acceptable. But now that they've asked for the five meters clear and not being clear, this would not be allowed. And it was a good one to show, uh, even though in the time the umpire got this one uh, right. But as the uh, understanding of the rule has now come out to the five meters clear, this one would not be acceptable um, to play on. And as the ball is falling, and you, the ball is actually falling here, falling down in here, no one is five meters clear. And actually when she receives it, this player is only about two meters away. This player goes behind her. Unfortunately, she misses it. But while the ball was up here, this should have been blown and given to the defense at this point, should be blown and given to the defense for a free hit out uh, at the top of the circle. <clears throat> and here's one, and I'm just going to run this quickly because I'm going to have to watch my time. 
where the defender actually stays away and then comes in. This is an easy play on. The defender was pretty much five yards away. We're not splitting hairs, but pretty much five yards away and was able to show good patience uh, for the attacker to bring the ball down. It's a good, clear attacker to attacker pass, uh, and the game can easily play on, and that's kind of what you want to look for. <clears throat> okay, Casey, are there any questions at this point? Uh, we do have one that says, please tell us where the aerial falling ball statement is in the NFHS rulebook. Uh, they rule don't see it in the points of emphasis. Okay, it's actually in the rules. We went back to that. 8.1.1 uh, point something. Uh, it's in rule 8. I do know that. Uh, we'll go back to that, but it's in rule 8 for sure. There it is, 8.1.1G. There's your falling aerial ball rule. Okay. All right. Okay. One of the things that was brought up as well <clears throat> is deflections versus, and I'm going to have to go back to my other screen, Casey, because I'm going to draw on this one. Um, high deflections do not fall under the aerial ball rules. Okay. Deflections are under separate rules in both rule books. And they're judged strictly on danger. Okay? They are judged strictly on danger. Any restart of a deflection that is deemed dangerous is taken where the deflection happened. That's where the action causing the danger occurred, not where the players in danger are located. Typically, here, okay? And this is just a little bit of a setup, but it's gonna make the point. If the free hit is being taken right here and the red team chooses to try to send the ball into the circle and it gets deflected by the blue player here and into these players here, okay, and it's a direct, uh, I'm going to call it a, a, a waist high line drive kind of thing, okay, the player who was at fault is right here. The red team gets the ball, but the free hit is taken right here. It's not a penalty corner because things had the danger where the players were in danger is in the circle. This is where the action causing the danger occurred. So in turn, this is where the ensuing free hit is. And likewise, for the ones that, that kind of go way overhead and very high, and I'm gonna use two examples here, the free hits being taken here and the red team is going to our left. If they go to drive the ball, and it's off of this player, and it does a very high deflection towards these two players, okay? These two players aren't getting away from each other. It's not an aerial ball rule. Nobody has to give five yards. And this is the same type of danger as we were showing back near the circle. This must be blown early so we don't end up with two players with their sticks in the air as to who can get to it first. It's the same type of danger as we showed before, coming down in between two players. This player is the responsible party, and this is where the free hit is given to the uh, team in red, okay? And then by the same token, these things can happen even further where the ball gets through, and let's say the, the uh, red player here deflects it. And it ends up going nice and high to these two players. Okay? Because it happened down here, we do not get, because this is where the danger is to the players, this is not where the free hit is taken. The free hit is taken here where the red player deflected it up. So it's where the action causing danger occurred. So please be aware of that when you're dealing with deflections. Okay, <clears throat> one of the other issues that was brought up is we were talking about uh, contesting a play versus physicality. And hockey is not a contact sport, but we know there is some contact of the bodies as you go to challenge for the ball, okay? 
but players must not tackle unless they're in a position to do so without body contact. There are too many times that umpires have been allowing players to run through players, hit them with upright bodies, going, oh, their momentum took them into them. A player is responsible for their momentum. Reckless play, sliding tackles, over physically challenges that either take opponents to the ground or have the potential to cause injury must be addressed, okay, with the appropriate match, free hit, or personal penalties, okay? These type of things uh, are very crucial to the game and very crucial to the safety. And just as it says in the NFHS rule, you know, fouls, charging, pushing, tripling, tripping, or personally handling an opponent. These are all misconduct fouls that need to be handled by the umpires to keep the game safe. <clears throat> I'm going to run through these relatively quick, but here's a player comes across, makes no attempt to play the ball, and just runs into the player. The umpire, as you can see, does not puts their arm out and gives a simple free hit. This is what I was talking about when an umpire goes, ah, her momentum took her into her. She didn't mean to knock her down. But she is responsible for her actions, and the player in blue could have easily gotten hurt. So in turn, this must be handled. And since this one is inside the 25-yard line, this is a high school game. This should have been a penalty corner. And any of these physical challenges uh, are pretty much on the upper level of the penalty scale, so should be 10-minute physical uh, yellow cards as well to keep the game safe. Here's another one with no regard for the player. <clears throat> the defender comes out and just runs straight through. Yes, she has her stick on the ground. Okay, and she's going to show you that as she gets her card. She's actually going to show the umpire that I was trying to come in on the ball. But she had no regard for the other player whatsoever and came straight through. Again, not a proper tackle and just a disregard for the other player. Therefore, in this case, she is being sent off uh, with a card. Okay. This goes for the attackers as well. Too many times the attackers will run through the ball. And as you're going to see here, she runs over the defender. And if you watch this closely, the defender is actually standing still. And the attacker runs into her. You're going to see she's standing still with a with a stick out trying to block tackle, okay? And the attacker actually runs over her. In this situation, this one should have been a free hit out. I don't know that it really would have warranted a card, but depending on the context of the game, it really could have been. But you have to be aware that the attackers, the exact same thing can happen with the attackers. Okay, Case, any questions at this point? Nope, all good. Okay, all right, very good. It's pretty fast paced, okay? Uh, a couple of the things that we do want to touch base on is influence from the sidelines. Uh, we've gotten ourselves to a point in hockey, as many sports have, of a lot of talk, influence, questioning coming from the sidelines. And both USA Field Hockey and the NCAA and the NFH and every state association does not condone uh, any influence on the game from the sideline. If there's a proper question to be asked, that's fine. But yelling foot, yelling five yards, um, what was that call as an umpire is trying to do something? We need to minimize the influence from the sideline. I'm going to use a quote from one of my fellow umpires who was doing a presentation and the first thing she said in the presentation is never does an umpire walk into a game and say, I'm going to screw this up today. They come in, they do the best they can with the knowledge that they have, and that needs to be respected. So in order to keep their concentration, not inciting anything from a team, crowd, or player perspective, we're asking that everyone abide by the code of conducts that are out there, and the rules of the NCAA, USA Field Hockey, and the NFHS when it comes to challenging officials' decisions or trying to influence the game. 
abusive outbursts and misconduct are not good. Uh, you know, we, we all know we're all hockey folks. We all know we're in a struggle for growing the game. And these kind of things do not help. All right. And the negative impacts on them uh, are not good for us. The one thing uh, crowding players around an umpire is not permitted. If a player has a question, that's fine. And they can come up and ask a respectful question. But when players start crowding around umpires, you're now on the verge of misconduct. OK, you cannot have four people yelling at an umpire with questions. If one player wants to ask, and usually it's the captain, doesn't always have to be. But as long as it's done respectfully, an umpire can give an answer and we can move on. But crowding around umpires is not to be permitted and umpires should handle that. The one reason I bring this up is we've over the years, we've had discussions with conferences uh, and states and others about influencing the game. And we always hear about, not always, but we hear some issues of things from the sideline, but the umpires have not given cards or dealt with the issue as it should be dealt with. We are strongly suggesting that umpires deal with these things, nip them at the bud, like we do with most of the other fouls that we deal with, and then move on from there. Um, you know, the NFHS has their rules and cards progression. The NCAA has theirs as well. Um, they're a little bit different, but it needs to be used uh, when necessary. Hopefully it's minimal and doesn't happen very often, but we're all passionate people. So we do understand the passion behind different things. Okay. Uh, umpires should communicate clearly through their whistle, their signals and messages to the players should be clear and brief. We are not here to have discussions back and forth. We are not here to have debates. Umpires. The players need to know what you want from them, okay? The one thing, we do this in every one of our presentations, the one thing that you have on the field that no one else has is a whistle. If you keep telling a player, back up, back up, back up, they're not listening to you because it's not the coach's voice and it's not a parent's voice. So use your whistle, get their attention, professionally have them move the ball back to where you need to, and you can move from there. Um, umpires, when you're asked the proper question, respectfully respond with the answer and basically be done with it. There are, there's no reason for a discussion about any decision in that moment. It's okay to say that was for obstruction or it hit the blue foot or a stick tackle from behind. That is a very quick, clear and brief response. There's always gonna be discussions about it later. And of course, even here, we were able to look at so many videos that the umpires didn't have an availability to see at the time. So in turn, it's much easier to see these things later as well. But in that moment, we can have a discussion, okay? Uh, when radios are being used, they are used to en enhance the communication between the umpires and to increase the accuracy of decisions. Umpires, you must work with each other to decide how you're gonna use the radios, where you're gonna help each other, where you're going to stay out of your umpire's ear, how you're going to cover the field. So these are not for me or for one umpire to call the game for another umpire or for a coach to be yelling from the sideline. That's obstruction, knowing that it's on an umpire's radio, that the other umpire can hear it. We don't want any of that. Those are all influences in the game that are not good for the game. So umpires use your radios effectively and just to enhance. They are not here as a chat room okay and then coaches we respectfully ask uh then when you do have a proper question please ask it um respect the answer and then we have to move on and i don't say agree with the answer because you may not agree with it but it's what the umpire saw it's the decision they had to make in the moment and we can have back and forth discussions on it and that has to be done in a proper forum uh in, a, in and at a time that does not um infringe on the umpire's ability to uh, stay concentrated on the game. Okay, well, I'm five minutes ahead of my hour, but uh, questions. Casey, do you have any questions? Yep, we have a question here that asks, how long after a situation can a team ask for video review and who can ask for that review? Okay, uh, obviously at the, and, and you can put the camera back on me if you want to, Casey. 
if it's easier to for communication. Um, at the NCAA level, the rule states that it should be done immediately. Now, immediately is a very difficult word. Uh, in the modifications for video referral, we've put in a guideline of about three to five seconds because it does take some time for a player to process what happened, understand what the umpire called or didn't call, and then be able to ask for it. What we don't wanna have happen is a foot in the circle, the umpire misses it, now it's going up the opposite sideline because uh, the team counterattacks, the ball's across the 50 yard line, inside the 25, and now 10 or 15 seconds later, we're trying to call for a video referral, okay? Uh, that That is not the purpose of the rule, and that is not the way it should be. And it's only the players on the field that can call for the video review. Uh, we do run into some issues where uh, sometimes from the sideline, it's yelled to the players to ask for the video review, and that delays it. But basically, we've put in a guideline of three to five seconds. Cool. We do have another question here about um, any rules on a GoPro hanging on or in a goal. Okay. Um, there are no prohibitions to those. No, not prohibitions. Yeah, prohibiting those. Um, but they must be out of the way of the crossbar and the uprights and cannot, to give you the best example, it cannot sit on top of the crossbar or on the side uh, uh, uprights, okay, where the ball can hit it and come back into play. If it's going to be on a goal, it should be in the back of the goal. If it gets hit by the ball and gets ruined at that point, so be it. But it's not going to interfere with the play itself. So it must be far enough back off of the goal posts and the crossbar so it cannot interfere with play or the ball bounce off of it and come back into play. Awesome. Okay, so we do have another one here. It says... Is there a scenario where we might hold for advantage when a player approaches as the clear receiver is waiting for the ball? Hold for advantage as the clear. Well, if the player is clear, then they're clear. So there's really not a foul yet. If they come in and approach, the best thing you can do is shut it down because what you don't wanna have happen is pick up the pieces. If a player infringes that five meters, you have no idea what they're going to do. Are they going to come in and come across the player's stick? Are they going to try to play the ball in the air? So the suggestion, not the suggestion, by the rule itself, if that player is in five meters of clear space, it's their ball, and, and if the opponent infringes in that, you blow the whistle and give it to them. Okay? If it's not, and they stay out, then you can play on and allow the game, game to flow naturally. Awesome. Uh, we have one here about face masks on corners. Can you clarify where players with face masks can be on the field? And if a player steps outside of the area, what is the call? Okay. <clears throat> um, I can answer that for USA Field Hockey, and I can answer that for the NCAA. Okay. And in both entities, players are allowed to wear the flat plastic face masks anywhere on the field. So even though the penalty corner's over, if they choose to keep it on, they can, and they can discard it off the field whenever they need to. The caged mask uh, cannot be worn outside after the penalty corner is over. That's the one. It's an oboe mask that has like a metal grill on it. Looks almost like a catcher's mask. But for the high schools, the NFHS, each state is making their determinations on how to manage penalty corner face masks. Um, some are allowing them to be worn wherever they are on the field. Some are making them take them off after the uh, penalty corner. So you're for the high schools, you're going to have to talk to your state association and your state rules interpreter in order to uh, get a defined answer for that. Awesome. We I know we're running low on time, um, but we can do a couple more here. Yep. Um, how many quarters for middle school games? It's going to be four. Um, I believe uh, I would check with your state association on that as well. Uh, in some states, the NFHS governs the middle school. In some states, it does not. Um, so that is just something that you'll have to uh, talk to your state association and your umpire group 
Uh, whatever your umpire group is in your state should have that answer for you. Um, most middle school games, I think they've been playing 25-minute halves uh, up until this point. So I don't know whether they're going to go to quarters. Maybe they adopt the, two, the uh, four quarters. But again, that's going to be a state association decision. Awesome. Um, we do have a lot of good questions coming in. I know we're running low on time. So Steve, it's up to you if you want to keep answering or uh, we will have these listed on the website as well. Uh, we can. Well, we just hit our one hour and we said about an hour and then about 15 minutes for questions. So we can do a few more. The more we can answer, I think the better. OK, awesome. So we have one here in the case of a defender illegally playing an aerial near the circle or within the 25. Would that be a deliberate foul resulting in a corner? OK. The short answer is no. And this is this is going to great question, by the way. This goes right to my point earlier of umpires being overreactive or overbearing because it's inside the 23 meter line or the 20 or in the circle, 25 yard line or in the circle. OK, if you were not going to give a card for that and for the same situation in the midfield, you will not give a card for it inside the 25 yard line or 23 meter line and the same thing in the circle. OK, uh, we do get the question on occasion about goalkeepers and the ball being thrown into the circle. You must be consistent. The decisions on aerial balls must be consistent throughout the whole field. OK, there's no extra intent just because the ball's in the circle or inside the 25 yard line, 23 meter line. OK, so if you weren't if you were not going to card someone for that elsewhere, you don't do it there either. Uh, and you're going to find the early recognition of this will save. Uh, a lot of heartache on everybody's part to make that decision. Awesome. Uh, we have another one here. In a college game, if a team properly asks for a video review, but then changes their mind when the umpire asks them for a question, how should that umpire handle the situation? OK, good question. Once the team asks for the question or says they want a video review, the play will go to video review. There is no backing out of it. So what happens is they ask for the question and they, by rule, have 20 seconds to formulate the question to ask the umpire. So if I tell the umpire I show my T that I want a team referral, I get a minute. I got about 20 seconds to decide how I want to ask the question. If I don't ask that question within 20 seconds, the last play goes to review. OK. And if it is not in favor of the team who stopped the game, they lose their referral. So bottom line, once you do ask a question or you ask for a video review, there is no taking it back. Cool, uh, we'll switch back to aerials. We have another question on that. We may, may or may not have answered this already, um, but this person's asking, are free hits from aerials awarded where the ball lands or where it originated? If there's no danger as the ball is going up, okay, if the player's just on a free hit, a player's five meters away, five yards away. If the ball doesn't go high enough to clear them, then the free hit is taken right there because the danger, the action causing the danger is on the player who lifted it. So in that instance, it would be taken where the ball was lifted. Once it gets beyond that, the rules, as we showed earlier in the presentation, give the umpires and everyone uh, all the parameters of the rule so that danger doesn't happen at the other end. So the, the once it gets beyond that first five meters, the, the ensuing free hit, if there has to be one, is taken where the ball lands, not where the ball was lifted from. Awesome, okay. We have one here asking goalkeeper glove. This is a situation. The goalkeeper glove comes off during a penalty corner completely unintentionally because of the speed of the shot. The ball goes back to attacking player. She hits the ball towards the goal. The ball hits the glove. What's the outcome, a stroke or a penalty corner? If the ball was going into the, the FIH has just recently, <clears throat> recently uh, clarified this rule because it actually did happen in a game where the goalkeeper dove to her right, her stick came off with her with her padded glove with it, 
and a player went to put the ball in the cage and it affected the shot. Uh, if that does happen and the ball was going in the goal, if the ball was going in the goal, it's an unintentional foul on the goalkeeper that stopped a sure goal. Therefore, it's a penalty stroke. If the ball was not going in the goal, then it would be a penalty corner. Awesome. We have one here on goggles. Is it your understanding if states adopts that high school players shall wear goggles that penalty corners mass penalty corner mass will not be allowed? Uh, that will be up to the state, but my understanding with the two states that are uh, still going to mandate goggles, the penalty corner mass would not be allowed because they're mandating the goggles and you can't wear both at the same time. So the answer to your question is yes. Um, penalty corner mass in that situation would not be permitted by those states. All right, we have another video review question. What if a foul is seen that's not related to the team question and how vague can this question be? Okay, <clears throat> that's a little bit of a tough one. Um, but the, the vagueness of the question, <clears throat> the players asking the question must be specific. OK, they're asking for I'll just use an example, you know. A ball hit the foot in the in the circle. Um, defensive foot. We're asking for a penalty corner. OK, it can't be. Well, I think this happens. So can you look at that? No, the players must ask a proper question or ask for something to be reviewed. If an umpire calls the ball for hitting the foot and the ball didn't hit a foot, the quite, they, they ask for a video review and they say, we feel the ball didn't hit the foot. OK, we'll review it. No problem there. OK, and if in the viewing of the video, in the viewing of the video review, if something happened prior to the incident in question that had an effect on the game, that gets taken into consideration as well. Perfect example I, that I can give you is a player brings the ball down across the end line. The ball slightly goes over the end line. The umpire doesn't see it. The ball's brought back on, and now it's dumped onto the foot of a defender, and the umpire awards a penalty corner. Okay? And the team disputes that it's a penalty corner, but they see that the ball was out first before the penalty corner decision. That would be taken into consideration uh, in the decision because, in fairness, the ball was out of play. Okay? But because... That was the decision. The ball was out of play, all right? The team does not lose their referral in that instance because they never really got to the question because of what happened beforehand. And then going along with that, we have another question asking, can the trail official ask for a referral or does it have to be the ref who made the call? It, it must be with the official who made the call, okay? We're we cannot have someone 60 yards away ask for a video referral, okay? Um, if, I'm, if I'm the umpire standing at the midfield line and it happens to be down in my partner's circle, I have no idea if I'm doing my job right, looking off the ball and doing what I'm supposed to do, okay? It must be asked of the official who's uh, engaged in the play and by the players. Yeah, and I do have a note here from Liz, um, back to the goggles. We do want to clarify that there are three states that mandate goggles, and that is Maine, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. So just wanted to throw that in there for everyone that has any questions on that. Okay. Okay, and then Steve, on an attacking 23 meter free hit, if there is a lot of traffic in front of the attacker and not a clear path to goal, but a defender influences play before the ball goes five meters, are we going straight to a corner or a green card? As we said in our presentation, any foul, intentional foul inside the 23 meter line or the 25 yard line is a penalty corner. So the penalty corner is your first penalty. OK, that is the actual um, match penalty because the player fouled. Um, and it is intentional because players are to know and they do know that they can't engage until the ball went five yards if they weren't five yards away to begin with. So the penalty corner is first. Depending on the context of the game and how the umpires have tried to manage 
so that people understood what five yards was, a card could come with it. Um, could be a green card and eventually could be yellow if, if it, uh, the action persists. But to answer your question directly, the first line of action would be the penalty corner. Awesome. I know we're kind of jumping around, but I'm just seeing this question going back to um, the umpires and the referral. Um, they ask, what if the official making the call doesn't hear, but the trail official does? Well, to be honest, I haven't seen that situation actually happen. Um, and it's the player's responsibility to get the attention of the umpire as quickly as possible and show the T-signal, okay? You can't be doing that running away. It's not, I'm asking for a video review as I'm running away from the ball or because the play has turned and gone upfield. You must go directly towards the umpire, get their attention, and show that. Awesome. Um, we have another one here. Can a card be given for review that was seen on a video review? Example, if a player kicked the ball off the line and the umpire didn't see it, on, didn't see it, but on review it was seen as a deliberate foul in the circle, can a card be given if warranted? <clears throat> yes. Um, we don't use video review to review cards, but if something is picked up, the, and, and that's a good example, but a better example would be... Um, the ball hits an attacker's foot, but they were pushed down by a defender from behind and the umpire didn't see it. And, you know, the attacker says, well, it never hit my foot or the defender says it never hit my foot. And there's a physical foul. Uh, it can be recommended to the umpires of a personal penalty uh, based on what is on the video review. But it's not something that can be video reviewable, meaning it's not a question that you can ask to say, we want a card because of this. If it's something that happens in context of the game, personal penalties can be assessed after the video review. It's rare that that happens, um, and it would have to be something pretty egregious, uh, to be honest with you. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. Um, we have another one here. On a corner, if the defense deliberately takes the attacker out, would it be a card to the defender and a stroke? It could be, uh, in most cases, probably should be. If the defender acts intentionally slide tackles, runs over a, the player with the ball, uh, or a player attempting to get the ball, that's an intentional foul in the circle, preventing a player from playing the ball, thus a penalty stroke. The physicality is the misconduct, and the card should really come with it for the dangerous aspects and the possibility of injury. All right, we have a five yard question. If a free hit is taken directly outside of the circle, does the defensive player inside the circle have to be five yards away as if they are backed up towards the stroke line or can they shadow right along the circle line? Okay, if it is a stagnant free hit just outside the circle, let me, okay. If it's a stagnant free hit just outside the circle, okay, Everyone must be five yards away, five meters away. So if a defender backs up towards the penalty stroke mark, that's fine. If they go to the side around the circle, five yards away, that's fine. They cannot just stand inside the circle on a stagnant free hit just because the player can't come in. Now, if the foul happens quick enough and the player chooses to take a self-start to go around the circle, like I showed in one of the videos, the player can go around the circle and shadow until the ball has moved five yards or five meters, and then they can engage from there. But the short answer to your question is, even a free hit on the edge of the circle, all players must be five yards or five meters away. One more question, Case, if we have one. All right, um, we'll end on another aerial question. Those seem to be pretty popular. Um, an aerial an aerial ball cleanly lifted into the circle. The defender does not allow five meter clearance. The ball lands in the circle. Where is the free hit for the offense placed? Can you repeat that question? Yep, yep. There's an aerial that happens. It's cleanly lifted into the circle. The defender doesn't allow five meter clearance. So when the ball lands in the circle, where is the free hit for the offense? 
Okay, it wouldn't be a free hit. It would be a penalty corner because that's a defense foul in the circle. Um, because from the question, you're saying that the attack team was five meters clear. And then as the ball was falling, the defense came in and closed that up, not allowing for that five meters clear. Therefore, it would be a penalty corner against the defense. Great. Thanks, Steve. Do you want to answer any other ones or? Well, we're at our, we're pretty much at our time limit. So um, am I on the camera case? Yep. Yep, you're okay. on. Thank you. Um, uh, can you go to my screen or my laptop, please? Mm -hmm. All right, your screen should be showing. Okay. Okay. Um, here's just some information for you as we start to wrap up. Uh, if you're looking for more information on the rules, please feel free to visit the USA Hockey website, uh, www.usafieldhockey.com. If you click on the menu, then umpires, you'll find a behind the whistle section, and it has more than 50 situations of video, uh, text, uh, comprehensive applications, and some guidance uh, to help you understand the rules better. Uh, we'll continue with that. We put about one up a week, and we're looking to do that to help keep with the consistency. If you want to rewatch this presentation later on, uh, you can either reuse the link that you were sent or in uh, sometime tomorrow, USA Field Hockey will have it up on our website. It'll be under the same menu, umpires, and then under the resources. And then this presentation will be up indefinitely uh, until we do the next rules changes and allow uh, for us to do this again. So you have plenty of time to watch it on your own uh, throughout the process. Um, I do wanna thank you all uh, for participating in this. Uh, we hope you have a great season uh, whenever you can get back to hockey. And Casey, can you put the put the camera back on me? There you go. Okay. And just in closing, again, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate what all of you do, whether you're a player, coach, umpire, administrator. Um, it's our game, and we want to do the best we can to keep it going. I have to give great big shout outs to Casey Mirder and uh, Liz Chu, who were our producers in this. Liz is in the background uh, monitoring everything. Casey, thank you so much for the questions. Uh, these things don't happen without them. It's a big team effort uh, and great, greatly appreciate their help uh, as well. So again, thank you for participating. We wish you all the best and have a great hockey season whenever you can get back to hockey. Have a good night.